Good evening and welcome to the Center at Camden County College. My name is Jack Pesda, I'm the director of the Center, and I thank you so very much for coming out tonight on this very, very cold evening. But before I forget, I have to mention to you that I will be leaving briefly during the course of the talk, not, not because of lack of interest, but I have to go to a Board of Trustees meeting for about 20 minutes. But fortunately, Valerie will be here and uh, will take care of any, uh, I don't think there's anything to take care of. But anyway, I uh, call your attention to the audience survey uh, in your packet. Please make sure you complete that and uh, uh, turn it into one of our volunteers as you're leaving the uh, uh, auditorium. Also, please turn off your cell phones. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to mention uh, some future events at the center. Uh, we have a, uh, a program called Middle East, New Perspectives, and the first lecture in that series is uh, Wednesday, March 13th at 6.30 in this facility. Now, it's not actually a lecture, it's something we haven't done before. We're going to have a uh, dramatic performance in which the actor, single actor, will talk about, in a kind of comedic sense, will talk about growing up as the son of a Palestinian Muslim father and an Israeli Jewish mother in Israel. And that should prove to be pretty interesting. Uh, on the 23rd, we're going to have a, 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 a talk on um, uh, dehumanization. And it deals with a lot of problems that exist in the world and in our society. Because before actions are taken against individuals, those that are the perpetrators find that it's easier to do if they dehumanize them. And of course, this has been going on for, for millennia, but uh, nonetheless, it is a problem for, uh, for our society. And um, we also uh, actually, last night, the first in our series on autism began and uh, will continue for the next four weeks. And then on April 1st, we have a program coming up on Walt Whitman and the Civil War, which is always popular. But in any case, this series is made possible by a generous grant from the uh, Botsteiber Foundation, and uh, they have funded programs here in the past, and we're so glad they were able to do it again uh, this semester. Tonight's speaker, uh, Tom Santo Pietro. Uh, I think in this series you have to be you have to have an Italian surname to be able to talk in this series. I, some kind of requirement I didn't realize, but but uh, Tom graduated from Trinity University and Connecticut Law School, but he points out that having received his uh, law degree, he never actually practiced law, so uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, he came to realize that wasn't his, uh, his field. But he has a most amazing resume. He worked as a, a Broadway theater manager for 25, over 25 years, managing over 30 Broadway shows. And he's the author of a, a number of books, including The Sound of Music, and also one that really intrigues me, The Godfather Effect. We've done programs on, on the Godfather films, a couple of the Godfather films, and it's uh, most interesting. But what draws you here tonight is that we can hear the sound of music. <laughs> and so I'm so very glad that Tom was able to join us, and please welcome him to Camden County College. <laughs> oh. One last thing. At the end of the program, we'll be selling Tom's book on the sound of music for the bargain price of just $25 and you don't want to leave here without a copy of the book. Uh, well, first of all, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I love that introduction because the most important part of my resume is that I'm not practicing law. Uh, something the American Bar Association is thrilled with. And uh, also, I already had the plug for my book, so I don't even have to do it. Maybe I'll do it again later. Um, and uh, so I just, uh, I want to start actually, I always like to ask just by a show of hands, how many of you have seen the movie of The Sound of Music? Oh yeah, well so this is my kind of crowd. This is great. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I, I'm going to give you first some background uh, on the film and actually on the property itself. And, you know, I, 
uh, the Sound of Music was the first Broadway show I ever saw. I was a really little kid, and uh, my parents, you know, was our first trip to New York City, and you know, I wish I could tell you that I was this sophisticated five-year-old who thought, oh, what wonderful Rodgers and Hammerstein music. But the only thing I remember about it is that at one point, Rolf, you know, 16 going on 17, he rode his bicycle on the stage. I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. I thought, he rides his bike on a stage, no training wheels, I want a part of this world. Um, and. Uh, and then when I saw the movie, uh, I was still, you know, a little kid, and uh, I, I just flipped for this movie, and I really fell in love with Julie Andrews, as kind of the whole world did at that point. And, um, you know, I, I've realized with uh, it, it sort of, I, I, I like to start with the why behind the book. Why did I write, because these books take two years out of my life uh, from when I start until the actual publication date. Uh, and. I have realized in retrospect that writing about The Sound of Music for me is uh, unconsciously I've written a trilogy of books about family because the, uh, before The Sound of Music I wrote a, a book about the three Godfather films and The Godfather is all about family and The Sound of Music is certainly about family and my most recent book which just came out uh, last summer is about To Kill a Mockingbird, and that again is very much about family. So I, I wasn't even aware of it when, when I was doing it. Um, but, you know, uh, the sound of music in, in its uh, depiction of family is, some, is uh, a film I've always loved so much. So the backstory of the property, just to uh, uh, bring you up to speed is, as I'm sure you all know, it was uh, a huge hit on Broadway opening in 1959 with Mary Martin playing Maria von Trapp. And uh, it started a pattern that kept true for the film, which is the critics did not like it and the audience couldn't have cared less what the critics said. It was a story that really spoke to people. And so it, even with the critical brickbats, uh, it became a huge smash hit, and the film rights were sold for uh, over $1 million, which back in 1959 was an enormous sum of money. And so everybody expected that it was going to be the next huge big musical right away. And then the film version, any film version of The Sound of Music disappeared. It had been bought by 20th Century Fox, but the reason why it disappeared is because 20th Century Fox was on the verge of total bankruptcy and actually closed its doors. And the reason for that was Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And because the costs became so enormous on Cleopatra and there was no end in sight and it, it went on month after month after month. And you know, it's not every film where the leading lady can be condemned by both the Vatican and the United States Congress, <laughs> but Elizabeth Taylor uh, you know, managed to do that. And so uh, Fox, The Sound of Music disappeared. Nobody was talking about it again. And when they very tentatively reopened their doors, all they were doing were a couple of TV shows, and uh, Richard Zanuck had come in as the head of production. And so Richard Zanuck was literally rifling through the drawers looking for properties to get back up in terms of film production. And he came across, uh, it was just a, a, you know, a couple of pages on The Sound of Music, and he thought, oh, well, we should do this because everybody loves kids and everybody loves nuns, so we're gonna do this. And so the question became um, who they should get to direct the film. And they approached Gene Kelly, and Gene Kelly said, no way, much too sentimental for me. And then they approached William Wyler, you know, one of the all-time great film directors. And Wyler had three Academy Awards, and this was going to be his first musical. And they thought, oh, this is great. It'll give it uh, prestige. And so, it's announced that William Wyler is going to direct the film. And they go off on, but, but see, there were warning signs already that William Wyler was not the right person to direct this film. Because he went to see the Broadway show, you know, as his homework. 
And his comment afterwards was, they start telling this nice story, and then all these people start singing and dancing. What's that about? <laughs> you know, not a good mindset for a big musical. And so Weiler, they, he, they then go on a scouting trip to Austria, because they know they want to uh, film certain numbers over there, and then they'll do all the interior shots back in Hollywood. And when they're doing the scouting trip, and this really happened, they were in a helicopter, you know, looking at the possible Alp locations, and somehow during the helicopter flight, William Wyler, who was a refugee from, the, from Europe at the time of the Second World War, finds out that the helicopter pilot was in the German army, and he goes crazy, screaming at the pilot while they're flying in and out of the Alps. Sign number two, not a good match. <laughs> So Weiler drops out and 20th Century Fox is completely relieved he's not going to be directing the film. And one, they're walking through the commissary at 20th Century Fox one day and Robert Wise is sitting in the commissary. And uh, Zanuck talked to Wise and, and Wise was really upset because he was going to direct The Sand Pebbles, which he subsequently did with Steve McQueen but it had been delayed. And so he was sitting there in the commissary actually depressed because he thought, well, what am I gonna do? I have no film to direct. And they said, well, will you consider the sound of music? And so he listened to the score several times. His big concern was he didn't want it to be too sentimental, but he thought, I have a way, you know, I, I can do this because he really loved the music. So they now have Robert Wise on board and uh, they have signed Ernest Lehman to write the screenplay, a uh, terrific screenwriter who wrote the Hitchcock film North by Northwest, which I'm sure many of you have seen, and he had uh, uh, a number of other sort of classic films, Sweet Smell of Success. So they have a great director and they have a great screenwriter, and uh, now, of course, the question becomes who are gonna play the leading roles? And uh, this is where I had fun researching the book because since we all know the film so well, it's really interesting to think about the other possible people that might have been in the film. And uh, uh, things like the, for the mother uh, superior, they were thinking about Jeanette MacDonald, and, but she was uh, quite ill already. And uh, for Max, you know, the impresario who wants to make money off the kids, uh, they were thinking about uh, Noel Coward and Victor Borga. Uh, but of course, the biggest roles were Maria and the captain. And so for the captain, I'm gonna share with you a couple of the names and you can see what your reactions are to how you would have responded to these people. Uh, one person they thought about was Yule Brenner. Not bad. Um, then they thought about the young Sean Connery. Uh, they thought about Rex Harrison. And then there's the one that I still scratch my head over. You know, Hollywood is so nuts sometimes. These people are so crazy. Like in The Godfather, Michael Corleone, the, uh, Al Pacino, the ultimate Italian-American. They wanted Robert Redford to play that role. <laughs> so the head scratcher for me about Captain Von Trapp is they really considered Bing Crosby. And just wrong on every single level. And so uh, Robert Wise was really interested in Christopher Plummer. Be, uh, now Plummer at this point had, had minuscule roles in two films and that was it. He was a stage actor, a great one and uh, he did not want any part of The Sound of Music. And, uh, but Robert Wise really wanted him because he said he's gonna bring an edge that'll undercut the sentimentality. And uh, they wanted him to test and he wouldn't do a screen test, but Robert Wise flew over to London. And all Christopher Plummer agreed to was he would uh, darken, uh, I mean, put gray in his temples to just to see if he could look a little older on screen. And, he looked good on screen, you know, he's a handsome guy, and they, uh, they finally, they talked him into it. So uh, Christopher Plummer with great trepidation said, I'll do it. And of course, while this is going on is all the talk of who's gonna play Maria. And uh, some of the ideas were, uh, they actually thought about Grace Kelly, 
but you know, she was otherwise engaged in Monaco. <laughs> and uh, another head scratcher for me is Anne Bancroft. And just, I want you to think about this. Anne Bancroft was a great actress, but her name was Anna Maria Italiano. Now, why was she gonna be believable as an Austrian nun? It was just not gonna happen. But the most serious other person they considered was Doris Day. And Doris Day at the time was the biggest movie star in the world. She was a fantastic singer. She could really act. But Doris Day herself, smart, said, I'm so all-American, nobody's going to believe me as an Austrian nun. And she was out of the running. And it was at this point they started uh, really thinking about Julie Andrews. So the thing with Julie Andrews is, as you probably know, she was you know, really well known for Broadway, for uh, uh, My Fair Lady and for Camelot, but she had not appeared on screen yet. Uh, she had shot Mary Poppins, but it hadn't been released. And so Robert Wise called up his pal Walt Disney, because Mary Poppins was shot at, at Disney Studios. And he said, you know, we're considering Julie Andrews, but I don't know what she looks like on screen. Can I come over and watch 20 minutes of advanced footage from Mary Poppins? And Walt Disney said, sure, come on over. So they arranged like 20, 25 minutes of footage. And after about five minutes, Robert Wise turned to his associate and said, let's go sign her up this instant before somebody else gets her. He knew, he knew right away she was gonna translate beautifully on screen, and so they now had their Maria von Trapp. Um, so, and they uh, had a, a sort of mass, massive search for the children uh, until they came up with the seven that were cast in the film, and uh, they start shooting, uh, they first shot in uh, the sound stages in Hollywood, and uh, the very first uh, scenes they ever did were my favorite things. And what's remarkable about it is it's the beginning of, the, uh, of production, the first thing. So Julie Andrews has just met the kids. But when you, the adoration you see it with the kids with Julie Andrews was real. I mean, they loved her instantly and they have all talked about it in subsequent years. And at the same time, all seven of those kids were really scared of Christopher Plummer. Because, <laughs> you know, he was cranky and he didn't want to be in The Sound of Music and he was kind of forbidding. And the, the thing that's so funny about it is it helped the film because, you know, it gives another level uh, to the kids being a little afraid of their father. And uh, so they start filming in uh, Hollywood, and then they go to Austria, um, to Salzburg, for their location shooting, because they knew they wanted to do the big production numbers, The Sound of Music over there and Do Re Mi over there. And, uh, but the problem was somebody had not done their research properly, and they didn't realize that Salzburg, Austria, is the, has the 11th highest rainfall in the world. <laughs> So they get there and day one they can't shoot because it's raining and day two they can't shoot because it's raining and this goes on and on and on. And they would literally have to run out and they could maybe grab 30 seconds of usable film and that was it. Uh, so uh, I, I want to uh, set up for you uh, a, as an example of what great filmmaking this is and why the film works so well, uh, the, the opening of the film, which is you know, the title song of The Sound of Music, but I want to explain to you how it was done. So they knew they wanted, of course, that spectacular scenery, but uh, you know, it was 1965, the equipment was nowhere as sophisticated as it is today. And to get the opening shot, you know, swooping in, which we'll see, um, they needed, they had to rent a helicopter, and the cameraman had to be strapped to the side of the helicopter and hang out with the camera, and, you know, so that the shadow of the helicopter wouldn't uh, be on the ground. So it was very, very tricky. And so they said to the cameraman, so we're gonna strap you in and then you're gonna hang out of the helicopter and you're gonna film it. And he said, not so much. I'm not doing that. 
So they had to hire somebody else to shoot that part of the opening sequence. So, and what they did with the whole title number is it was shot in two separate times separated by a month. Uh, they had to do the first part with the helicopter and uh, the, uh, the zooming in, but the helicopter was so expensive that as soon as that was done, they went to another location to shoot the finale of them climbing over the Alps. And then the second part of the uh, number was Julie Andrews alone, you know, when she's with the birch trees and uh, singing about the brook, and that was filmed a month later. But so here we are at the first part, and the camera, it, so they, they have the helicopter pilot ready to go, the director is in a tree just off a, you know, camera range so that he can see everything. And they start and the, they say action and there's no Julie Andrews because the sound of the helicopter was so loud she couldn't hear the, the call for action. So the choreographer, whom I interviewed for the book, uh, grabbed a bullhorn. And when the time came, he would literally grab the bullhorn and he would scream, go, Julie, go! And she would come you know, down the meadow and do that twirl we all know. But the problem was the wash from the helicopter blades was so enormous that she got bashed into the ground on every single take. And so she has mud and she has hay coming out of her hair. And so this happened. <laughs> And she signals to the helicopter pilot like this, meaning make a wider arc. But he thinks Julie Andrews is saying to him, that's great, let's do another one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, this is not what Julie wanted. And so finally, part of the reason why she does that twirl in the beginning that we all know and that we're gonna look at is because it helped her plant herself in the ground so she wouldn't be knocked over. And so it was both, you know, kind of looked great on screen, but there was a very practical reason as well. And um, so then, uh, uh, so they finally, you know, get the, that part, it's like the first half of the song. And then the helicopter has to go because the helicopter has to shoot footage of them climbing over the Alps at the end. And so a month later, Julie, uh, by herself films the second half of the number. And so, you know, as we'll see, there's that beautiful little brook with the birch trees, only there was no brook on this property, which is way up in the Alps. So the, hot, the art department had to build the brook. Only the problem was the farmer who owned the land was so mad by this point because he said these Hollywood people were ruining the milk production of his cows. So he went out and he took a pitchfork and he drained the, the whole brook. So they had no brook, so they had to wait another couple of days until that was rebuilt. And the birch trees that look so beautiful were not birch trees, they were kind of elongated stumps, maybe about as high as I am, that they had, the art department again had to plant in there. And so it's all these little things that we're, when we watch it now, you know, we're gonna see how seamless it looks, but it was all these little decisions that go into it. And my final comment uh, setting up this opening is, you watch, uh, just one sec, sorry. Robert Wise, who was a brilliant film director, and he'd already won the Oscar for West Side Story, he was so smart about this. He said, I want the first shots of the film, I want silence. So he wouldn't let the 20th Century Fox logo, he wouldn't let the trumpets blare the way it does on all their films. He said, I want to bring people into this fairyland. And so you'll watch. First you just see these beautiful scenic shots, then you hear the wind. Then you hear the chirping of the birds, and then you hear the sound of the church bells. They spent a week getting what they thought were the right church bells. So, you know, it's this kind of meticulous craftsmanship. These were the last of the golden age studio system craftsmen. And uh, so, and then after you hear the church bells, that's when you start to see the scenery, and finally the camera swoops in and picks up Julie, who's planting herself in, in, in the mud, not to be knocked over. And, uh, and all of this, you know, went together 
it's kind of a perfect opening for a Hollywood musical because, you know, musicals, one false mo mo moment, and you're just thinking, nobody sings and dances like this. But in this one, you're brought into the world right from the start. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch. It's the opening of the film. It's about, oh, probably four, a little maybe five minutes. And uh, the nice fellow in the back is going to help me, and uh, we're going to uh, watch this, and then I'll come back and talk.